you should say something. I should say something. Um, how many people here have read something I've written? Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I started this story because it's the only Paris object writes short story. So it is the only sample of uh, my current literary style that's in short story form that can be consumed in the space of one reading because I thought I would be introducing the world to people, but I guess I'm introducing the world to two of you. <laughs> uh, the rest of you get a little peek into Alexia's distant past be when before she was a twinkle, um, because this <laughs> is a story about her father. Um, and very, er, it's very mod modestly steampunk because the technology isn't really getting a foothold yet. Um, and because of its location. So I don't think we really to go more than that. So, um, so uh, uh, you're going to do the dude voices? I'm the dude voices. I'm going to do the narration. Here we go. This, this is the other reason I think that we went with this. Is a, if we'd done the finishing school, I'd be doing a faux. <laughs> <laughs> I, always, I always dislike listening to male <laughs> readers do the old, hello. You know, that just doesn't matter. <laughs> what about female readers doing that? Uh, unless, you know, who was, who was the woman who broke the guy's legs, James Conn, in the Stephen King movie? Uh, Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates. Mm. Kathy Bates does men's voices really well. She's an incredible <laughs> narrator. There are people who can do it, just not that many. Yeah. Not all right. Uh, this might be the lengthiest title for a short story. You used to be an academic. <laughs> exactly. The curious case of the werewolf that wasn't, the mummy that was, and the cat in the jar. By me. You! Alessandro Terabati's forehead crinkled under his gray top hat. Was that some peculiar bird song? <laughs> Yoo hoo, Sandy! No, it was a voice hallooing at him across the broiling humanity of the bazaar. Mr. Terabati was so thoroughly distracted upon hearing such a name hollered at him in such a place and voice that he relaxed his grip. The place was Luxor. The voice was just the kind that bled the inner ear, trumpeting out a nasal ode to abundant schooling and little attention towards the details of it. He loosened his grip, allowed the scrubby native boy with terrified fly-ridden eyes to rip himself away and scuttle down a convenient alleyway, vanishing round a pile of broken pottery. Well, that's torn it. Alessandro threw the scrap of material he was left holding into the dirty street. He squinted into the alley, eyes adjusting slowly to the slatted light that crept through the reed mat stretched far above. High houses and narrow streets. Who would have thought that Egypt was a child of shadows and shade? Sandy, old chap! The voice was getting closer. Who knows you here, sir? Asked Plute. More to the point, who dare you who at me? Mr. Terabody turned away from the empty alleyway to glare at his valet, as though the greeting were somehow Plute's fault. Flute pivoted and gestured softly with his right hand. His left was occupied holding on to a large glass specimen jar. The youthur hove into sight. Alessandro winced. The man wore the most remarkably <coughs> bright blue frock coat, double-breasted, with brass buttons at the front. He sported a pair of rummox stained glass binoclu binocular spectacles perched atop his tiny nose, and a limp cravat. In Mr. Tarabati's world, nothing excused a limp cravat. <laughs> <laughs> Even the dead heat of Egypt at high noon. Do I know that <coughs> looking blighter? Flute twisted his mouth slightly to one side. Right, quite right, quite right. Someone from my early days, before I cultivated a brain. School, perhaps. Mr. Tarabati awaited his fate brushing a non-existent speck of dust from the sleeve of his own gold frock coat. Single-breasted, mind you, with pearl buttons <laughs> and a deceptively simple cut. Blasted English, blemishing about the world, is nowhere safe. Flute, who was himself an Englishman, did not point out that Alessandro Terabati was of a similarly unfortunate over-education as the man approaching, and he dressed and spoke like an Englishman. He didn't actually look like one, of course, boasting a long line of ancestors who had invested heavily in being dark, hook-nosed, and brooding. Uh, Mr. Terabody continued grousing right up until the yoo was an earshot. 
I mean to say, Big My Man, what are your countrymen about these days? You'd think they'd leave at least one small corner of the planet to the rest of us. But no, here they are, shining as old get-up, ever expanding the empire. We have benefited considerably from integration of the supernatural. Well, it's hell on the rest of us. Do stop it, will you? <laughs> Very good, sir. You hoo! You hoo! The man came to a wheezing halt before them, sounding like an exhausted steam engine, trailing some species of suitable young lady in his corpulent wake. Sandy Dandy the Italian! By Jove, it is you! Fancy, fancy, fancy! <laughs> Alessandro, who did not like the name Sandy Dandy the Italian, lifted his monocle and examined the man downwards through it. The man said to the monocle, Baronet Percival Finkelington, how do you do? At least he had the good grace to introduce himself. Mr. Tarabati put down his eyepiece pointedly. You will have to do internal dialogue. Oh, really? What a thing to do to one's cravat. <laughs> you know my brother, I believe. The face above the unfortunate neckcloth did have a familiar something about the eyes and mouth. Good Lord! Who paints kid brother? The man grinned and doffed his top hat. Right you are! Fancy, I was a bit smaller back when you knew me last. <laughs> Practically half the man you are now. <laughs> <laughs> you remember our sister? The lady in question went red under Mr. Tarabody's indifferent gaze. He didn't bother with the monocle for her. She bobbed a, a trembling curtsy. Ladies always caught the blush and flutters upon meeting Alessandro <laughs> Tarabody. He bowed. Miss Finkelington. Letitia, you remember Sandy? Mr. Tarabody, I should say. Italian chap, he went to Oxford with Eustace, <laughs> used to bowl for New College. Toddled down for a stopover one term break. She realized that I think I might be doing lemon grab. At <laughs> <laughs> the same time, Daddy had himself that whole werewolf pack visiting. He turned back to Mr. Terabody. Fancy meeting you here, in Egypt, of all places. <laughs> Indeed. Alessandro tried to remember why he would bother visiting this man's family. Had it been an assignment? Investigating those werewolves? Or, or had he been there to kill someone? <laughs> Perhaps just a mild maiming? <laughs> Baronet Finklington <coughs> leaned in conspiratorially. You ought to see to your man there, Sandy. You realize he's got his arm around a jam jar of dead cat. Mm, yes. Pervert preserved in some of my best formaldehyde. <laughs> the baronet gave a nervous laugh. Boys were a bit peculiar, Sandy. Eustace <laughs> <laughs> seemed to like you well enough. I say, this may be Egypt, but trailing around dead cats. Not the done thing. I have an eccentric aunt. Reply. <laughs> <laughs> As though that were explanation enough. Don't we all, my dear fellow? Don't we all? It's her cat. Or it was her cat, I should say. Miss Finkelington noticed the valet with the jar of dead cat for the first time. She colored a muted sage and turned away, pretending interest in the bustling natives ebbing and flowing around them. A proper Englishwoman must find it a spectacle indeed, that tide of humanity in its multicolored robes, veiled or turbaned according to sex, loud and malodorous regardless. Flute. Alessandra, oops. I'm not, I'm not the narrator. <laughs> <laughs> Flute. <laughs> Alessandro used Miss Finklington's discomfort <clears throat> as an excuse. Shove off, will you? <coughs> find out what happened to our young friend. I'll see you back at the hotel. Flute nodded and disappeared across the bazaar, cat in tow. Baronet Finkelington seemed to take that as an end to the business. Well, 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 what a thing to see you here. Been in a while, old chap came for the climate myself, wettest winter and a dog's age, decided on a bit of a change. Thought Egypt might suit. Imagine, England having a wet winter. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Egypt here, a bit uh, warmer, you understand, than I was expecting. But we've been taking the ether regular like, haven't we, Letitia? Keeps the body cool, that. The baronet jerked his head at, up at three large balloons hovering high above Luxor. They were tethered by long cords to a landing platform dockside. Well, that explained the man's abysmal choice of eyewear. <laughs> Tinted spectacles were recommended for high floating. The baronet persisted in his social niceties. And are you having an agreeable trip? Can't stand travel, replied Mr. Terabody. Bad for the digestion and ruins one's clothes. Too <laughs> true. Fingerlington looked suitably somber. Too true. Moving hurriedly on from a clearly distasteful topic, he asked, Staying at Chumley's Inn, are you, Sandy? Alessandro nodded. It was the only place to stay in Luxor. Alexandria and Cairo provided a number of respectable hotels, but Luxor was still provincial. <laughs> For example, it boasted a mere three balloons, and only one with a propeller. It was a small village, really, in an almost forgotten place of interest primarily to those with an eye towards treasure hunting, which didn't explain why Finkelington and his sister were in Luxor, nor, of course, why Alessandro Terabati was. Ca uh, catch a bit of nosh later tonight, old man. Alessandro decided it was probably better for his image to be seen dining in the company of British tourists than to be observed too frequently about his own private business. Certainly. But now I'm afraid I must beg to be excused. My man, you understand, is gadding about Egypt with a dead cat. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Terabody bowed to Miss Finkelington, who pinked once more at such direct attention. Not a bad-looking chit, really. As he walked away, he heard the baronet say in tones of deepest censure and insufficient softness, Really, Letitia, Italian is most inappropriate. You must stop blushing at him so significantly. Mr. Terabody found flute exactly where flute ought to be at the center of a milling whirl of dark limbs and bright fabric engaged in a protracted bout of fisticuffs. <laughs> it was unsurprising that Flute, who had fought werewolves in Scotland and vampires along the French Riviera, was holding his own. What was surprising was that he did this while still clutching the jar. Alessandro removed his jacket and laid it atop a low mud brick wall. He rested his hat carefully alongside. The jacket was tailored to perfection, flaring with just under enough fullness so as not to be thought dandified. It had three sets of invisible pockets in the lining, each housing a collection of sharp little sticks, silver, wood, and peppermint. The silver was for werewolves, the wood was for vampires, and the peppermint was for Mr. Terabody. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Terabody was fond of peppermint. He was also fond of the jacket. It wouldn't do for it to be harmed, and he wouldn't need the weaponry, not in the middle of the day. He did tra transfer the letter of Marquis from the jacket to the waistcoat pocket next to his monocle, his mini miniature antiquarian device for extra security. Then he dove into the fray. Alessandro was not burdened with Flute's sentimental British predilection towards proper violent comportment. When Mr. Terabody fought, he used both his fists and his feet drawing upon some spate of skills he'd learned in the Orient. He would have been summarily thrown out of whites, for his technique was, it must be admitted, most ungentlemanly. <laughs> he enjoyed himself immensely. Mr. Ted Terabody had always been fond of the occasional pugilistic endeavor, ever since he was a boy, reveling in that delicious slap and crunch of flesh against flesh. He relished the heated blood buzzing through his brain, numbing <coughs> all senses but those vital to security, sight, and touch. Any pain was a boon, a reminder of watchfulness, that he must keep his mind in play only so much as it did not hinder. It was almost too easy. Flute's attackers were ill-prepared for Mr. Terabody's sudden appearance. Soon enough, the swirling mix of appendages and colorful flowing robes resolved itself into three local malcontents, one fallen and two running away. While Flute recovered his equanimity, Mr. Terabody sat astride the fallen man. He grabbed the man's arms, pressing them to the ground. Who hired you? He asked in English. 
No response. He repeated himself in Italian. The man only looked up at him, dark eyes wide. He writhed about in the dirt, shaking his head frantically back and forth as though in the throes of some fit. Then, before Flute could put down the cat and render assistance, the man surged off, shook Alessandro off, and dashed away. When Flute would have gone after, his master stayed him with a touch. No advantage in following. We won't extract any information from the likes of him. Too frightened. Of us? Of whoever paid them to engage the foreigner brandishing a dead cat? I heard by your contact, sir. Perhaps he changed his mind about notifying the government. No, no, I think not. There's someone else in play, or several someones. Deuced inconvenient, not to mention insulting. As if I would gad about town dressed like a manservant. He went to retrieve his jacket and hat. Who might be looking to stop you, sir? Flute came over and straightened his man's master's lapel, checking the fit of the shoulders for good measure. Much good that blasted cat has done us. And it would provide quite the excuse for visiting Egypt. Now it's just making us easy to identify. The cat had caused quite a flutter at customs. Officials were used to dead animals being transported out of Egypt, usually of the mummy variety, but not in. Luckily for Mr. Tarabati's aunt, gold worked regardless of country, and Mr. Tarabati had the gold. The cat had served its purpose until now. After all, why else would a rich Italian gentleman be traveling to Egypt during the high season of 1841? We must get rid of it, Flute. Flute shifted his grip on the jar. Shall I leave it in the street, sir? Good God, no. Aunt Archangelica would never forgive me. Find someone to fix it up, as she demanded, and quickly. Very good, sir. Sunset found Baronet Finklington and Miss Finklington awaiting Mr. Terabody's presence at dinner in the hotel dining hall. Some crosses were meant to be suffered during one's lifetime, Alessandro supposed. He joined them with a tight little smile and helped himself to a glass of the mostly empty bottle of wine. Sunday evening, the baronet squawked. Miss Finklington blushed and nodded. Good Lord, man. Mr. Terabody sipped the wine it was cloyingly sweet. Don't you own any other neckwear? The pleasantries thus disposed of, Mr. Terabody settled, settled back languidly in his chair, waiting for the first course of what he had no doubt was to be an utterly unsatisfactory meal. What happened to old Pink? He's only half interested. Well, he was due for the title, not you. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught someone <coughs> watching him closely from a nearby table. He leaned back in his chair on two legs, tilting his head about in an attitude of foppish boredom. The watcher was a military gentleman of some breed, stiff about the neck and long about the hair. The man noticed Mr. Ter Mr. Terabody noticing him and returned to his food. Baronet Finkerlington frowned, troubled by the Italian bluntness. You didn't hear? Married beneath his station, did he? Go into trade? Die. Alessandro tut tutted and declined to remark that society gossip was not his focus during those few times he'd returned to England. Miss Finkerlinton put a hand on her brother's arm. Don't, Percy dear. He patted her hand. It's all right, Letitia. Sandy here is an old fellow of Eustace's. Eustace always spoke highly of him. Played cricket together. Solid fellow. He leaned towards Alessandro, his breath redolent with the scent of cardamom and burnt eggplant. Eustace tossed the title over, gave it up, to become clavager to some toothy old fluff of a lone werewolf. They always do take the smart ones from a family, don't they? <laughs> Mother was devastated, but between you and me, it's probably for the best. Wouldn't have gotten any grandkids out of old Eustace, if you get my meaning. The baronet waggled his eyebrows. <laughs> Mr. Terabody did. It also tickled his memory and explained why he'd visited the Finkelingtons all those years ago. Not an infiltration, as it turned out. At least, not an official one. <laughs> Do I say felicitations? Mr. Terabody sampled a rolled ball of some fried brown crispy substance. 
that in appearance resembled meat and in taste re resembled sawdust. Only if he makes it through the bite and chain. You understand how it goes? So silly me, you don't, do you? Poor man. Italian. The baronet shook his head sadly, demonstrating the pity of the one country that accepted the supernatural for all those other poor, ignorant countries that had not. Open acceptance of vampires and werewolves was the thing that kept the British Isles separate from the rest of Europe. Well, that and their cuisine. <laughs> Alessandro stroked thoughtfully at the indent above his upper lip. Ah, uh, the English. Confident in but two things. And what are those standing by that? The supernatural and cricket. Baronet Finklington laughed heartily and then stuffed his face with a number of the most uninviting looking little cakes imaginable. You insulting the national pastime, old chap? He said, <laughs> fortunately after he'd swallowed. Which? Supernatural or cricket? Cricket, of course. You used to bowl a nicely lethal game yourself, if memory serves. Spinner, no? Peaceful. The baronet nodded. Ah, yes, I remember Eustace crowning and crowing about how fast you were. <laughs> Alessandro, <laughs> Alessandro raised both eyebrows at that, but didn't reply. <laughs> Out of the corner of his eye, he observed the blonde military gentleman stand up from his table and make his way toward the door moving behind and around the various chairs in the dining hall with precise little twists. He disappeared, not upstairs to his rooms, as one might expect, but out into the cold night. Fancy a little stroll, Finkerlington? suggested Mr. Terabody, pushing his plate away petulantly. The baronet, whose corpulence suggested he never fancied a stroll, little or otherwise, looked to his sister for salvation. She proved herself of no use whatsoever, a state evidently familiar to all around her, by saying, Oh, yes, Percy, dear, do go. You know I shouldn't mind. Some of the other ladies were planning on a game of bridge in the drawing room. I shall be perfectly entertained there until your return. Baronet Fingerlington's only possible excuse, thus occupied with cards, the poor chap could do nothing but join Mr. Terabody on his preambulation. The hotel was situated near the northern edge of Luxor, the better to take in the view, such as it was. Sand and dust on one side and the Nile River on the other. They turned away from the verdant embankment with its cultivated palm groves and headed toward the desert in all of its burnt glory. A harvest moon hung low over two sets of limestone mountain ranges, one near and one far. Mr. Tarabati pulled out his Antikara device and confirmed his suspicions. Cool. Crikey, that darn moon's bigger than a bison's bottom. Very poetical turn of phrase, <laughs> Baronet. Mr. Terrybody put the Antikara away and searched the quiet streets. It was prayer time, so they were mostly deserted. Yet he could not spot the military man. They paused at the very edge of town. The Baronet took out a large cigar, nipped the tip, and lit it with one of those newfangled Aetherospark distributors. Tell you the truth, old man, we're here for Letitia's health. Can't she withstand the damp? No, not that. Hers is a health that's not quite right about the head. If you comprehend my meaning, ever since Eustace went over, gypsies and night crawlers everywhere and wakes up scream. Thought we'd bring her here. He puffed on his cigar. Because there are no supernatural creatures in Egypt? Mr. Terabody moved out of the smoke, coughing delicately. Cheap cigar. So they say, so they say. Like no snakes in Ireland, it's one of those things. True enough. There hasn't been a werewolf south of Alexandria in living memory. Alessandro thought of the papal letter of Marquis tucked securely in his waistcoat. Make a study of the supernatural, do you, Sandy? Mr. Tarabati said nothing. Of course you do. You Italians are all the same. Religious fanatics, the lot of you. Church says jump, you bounce around waving silver and wood, hoping it'll rid the world of all the ghost chump in the night. And yet, I see the acceptance of the supernatural has clearly done you and your family proud. Touché, touché, fair enough. I'm not claiming to be a progressive, simply saying as how one extreme don't balance out the other. 
far as I'm concerned, vampires and werewolves can do theirs, so long as I'm let alone to do mine, if you take my meaning. He removed the half-finished cigar from his mouth and looked at the glowing tip thoughtfully. Would you be so magnanimous, Baronet, had you not inherited a title because your brother chose the supernatural over family obligation? Now see, uh, that's hardly the thing to say. Mr. Terabody held up a hand sharply, cutting off any possible tirade. He cocked his dark head to one side, listening. Far away, somewhere in the depths of the desert, Wadi, something howled. Damn this country with all its boring critters. I'm telling you, it's all very well for the teacher's peace of mind. Not a vampire in sight, but all these snakes and camels and jackals are playing hell with my inner feet, my finer feelings. Baronet Figlington turned away, snorting. Alessandro frowned. The howl came again. Werewolf. The baronet tossed the butt end of his cigar petulantly to the sandy ground. That moon may be full, but don't be ridiculous. You just said, remember? There are no supernatural creatures in Egypt. Flute was waiting for Mr. Terabody in their room. Message, sir. He held out a little wooden tray with two crisp pieces of papyrus on top. Scribbled on the top one was a message in Italian, the tiny, messy script bleeding in places along the lines of the fibrous paper. Alessandro deciphered it while Flute divested him of his coat and hat. I'm to go there tonight. The apologist for the skittish messenger this morning. Apparently the boy was supposed to deliver this, but was spooked by our cat. Imagine being raised amongst mummies and fearing modern scientific preservation techniques. He switched to the second sheet of papyrus. The map. Very thoughtful. I wonder if that's what those bully boys were after this afternoon. This map. Lowering his hand, he raised an eyebrow at his manservant. Speaking of the cat. Flute pointed to a wobbly reed dresser upon which lay a smallish cat mummy. Is that not your aunt's feline, sir? The reports were perfectly correct. No one remembers how to mummify anymore. I found a willing apothecary, but the results were regrettably... A delicate pause. Squishy. <laughs> I managed to acquire that artifact there at a reasonable price and in excellent condition as a substitute. Mr. Terabody peered at the specimen through his monocle. It'll have to do. We'll tell Aunt Arch Angelica they made it look emaciated and ancient for the sake of fashion. <laughs> Flute went to hang up his master's outerwear. Don't bother, Flute. I'll need it again directly. Yes, sir. Tonight, remember? He wiggled the papyrus with the mat on it at his valet. Of course, sir. But surely not the gold coat. Most inappropriate for one of your evening engagements. Silly me. You packed the burgundy? Good gave him a look and suggested he was gravely insulted that Mr. Terabody should ever doubt such a thing. <laughs> the burgundy jacket was a comparatively stylish affair, but cut looser than the gold to better hide in multiple pockets, and with a fuller skirt to mask any additional accoutrement secreted about a gentleman's waist. Alessandro slipped it on while Fluke bustled about putting various items onto a large silver platter which he then proffered politely to his master. Mr. Terabody selected from the offerings, as a man will from a particularly delectable cheese plate, a nice bit of garrote there, two vials of quality poison here, a tin of Germany's best phosphorus matches for extra zest, and a flask of turpentine to wash it all down. He chose one of the two pistols, the smallest and his personal favorite, checked that it was loaded and stashed it inside a pocket over his left hip. After a pause to think, he took three cigars and the tidy little cheroots he preferred and stashed them in a tin with the matches. Will you be requiring my company this evening, sir? I shouldn't think so. After all, he is only an archaeologist. Flute so refrained from comment upon that statement. He had spent over ten years as valet to Mr. Terabody and... As yet, no one had turned out to be only anything. He smoothed down the sleeves of the burgundy coat and checked its armament carefully before buttoning it closed. He handed Mr. Terabody a matching top hat. Will there be anything else, sir? 
Alessandro tightened his lips over his teeth and thought. Perhaps the other gun as well, if you would be so kind. Flute passed it to him. Try not to kill anyone important, sir. Stashing the gun up his sleeve in a special quick-release wrist holster, Alessandro grinned. It was an expression that did not sit comfortably on his patrician face. Any final orders, sir? 